Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part two of our six-part series on consciousness in the brain with Professor Stuart Hameroff with the Banner University Medical Center at the University of Arizona, where he is a professor of anesthesiology and psychology. Stewart is also the co-founder of the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona and the organizer of the Toward a Science of Consciousness Conference, which has been hosted by the University of Arizona now going back to 1994 on an annual basis. A major pioneer in consciousness theory, the developer of the Orc or theory of consciousness with Sir Roger Penrose. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Yeah, likewise. You come to the field of consciousness as an anesthesiologist, uh, which makes perfect sense, uh, although it seems as if there, most people would think uh, of someone studying consciousness should be a philosopher or a psychologist or a uh, neurologist. Tell me about the history of anesthesiology as it pertains to the study of consciousness. Right, well anesthesia takes away consciousness and then it's restored when you turn the anesthesia off or you get rid of the anesthetic. And it's fairly selective in that under anesthesia mm -hmm. the brain is quite active. We can record EEG, it just tends to get a little bit slower. We can uh, record evoked potentials, mm -hmm. and in fact we do this clinically. So for example, if the surgeon is working on the spine uh, and the neck or the back, uh, we can stimulate from the feet or the arms and record from the brain on the opposite side to make sure that the signals are getting through the spinal cord into the brain. This They're is a surprising finding already. Uh, I mean, most people would probably imagine that if you're out cold under anesthesia that your nervous system is quite Quiet. Correct, and it's quieter, but it's not it's not totally quiet, and it's quite active. Uh, EEG gets slower, as I said, evoke potentials. There's lots of stuff going on, but most of what the brain does is non-conscious anyway. Consciousness is kind of a, a small piece of what the brain does. The most essential piece, probably the most essential thing in the in the universe, is consciousness. It's really all that really matters when you come right down to it. But under anesthesia, consciousness is erased, suspended however you want to describe it, and then it comes back. And uh, it's pretty much, re uh, pretty much reversible, except in some rare circumstances. Mm -hmm. And the field of anesthesia started uh, when? <laughs> well, in ancient times, uh, when surgery was required to cut off a, 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 you know, a, a dead limb or to cut away uh, necrotic tissue, uh, or uh, in the case of uh, mental dis disease, they would cut holes in the skull, trephination, yes. let out evil spirits. Whether that worked or not, we don't know. But uh, what they used back then was, were things like uh, opioids and um, uh, drugs, hashish, alcohol, uh, to numb the senses. But mm -hmm. of course, they don't put you to sleep except in really, real bi big doses, and then you have trouble breathing and so forth. So there were some problems. Interestingly, the, the Mayans who did trephinations uh, uh, in the Andes, um, the, uh, the priests, the shamans, uh, apparently would chew cocaine and spit into the wound to make the wound numb. Uh, these are local anesthetics. The patient mm -hmm. didn't go to sleep, but at least the wound was numb from the effects of the, uh, the cocaine, uh, which was spat into the wound. Now, the sterility of that, I don't know, but uh, it, and we don't know the results, but w there are pictures depicting this that are very it's interesting. A creative approach. Yeah, yeah, I had to give him credit for that. The modern era of anesthesia started in the 1800s um, or so with uh, uh, ether and nitrous oxide, which were used originally for social reasons, ether frolics. Uh, people figured out that if they, they took a whiff of ether, they got really high and, and jubilant and, and had a great time. Uh, at, at higher doses, they would pass out. And nitrous oxide or laughing gas, mm -hmm. they would breathe. And uh, again, they would have a, feel really good for a short period of time. I know like William James r reported in varieties of religious experience that he took nitrous oxide, essentially, I guess you'd have to say for recreational purposes, yeah. and yeah. had a quasi-mystical experience. Yes, yes. That's 
been reported. And uh, again, uh, uh, it's dose dependent. So at certain low doses, you are still awake, but excited or, or in a mystical state or however you want to describe it. And at higher doses, you lose consciousness entirely. And so that's how it started with ether frolics and laughing gas. Now also in the 19th century, if I remember rightly, you had uh, Esdale uh, performing surgeries using hypnosis. Uh, that may be the case. Uh, I don't know about that. And people have tried hypnosis. Mm -hmm. People have tried acupuncture in China for tonsillectomies and so forth. Uh, how well that works, we don't know because uh, you know cult there are cultural differences. Yes. And uh, hypnosis and uh, electroacupuncture have been tried in modern times, but they're not very reliable. Mm -hmm. Whereas the anesthesia we have today is very uh, reliable and uh, fairly safe after mm -hmm. uh, all these years. Um, the, the, the question is, you know, how does it work? How, do, uh, how does anesthesia prevent consciousness? How does yes. it work in the brain? And that's where the scientific aspect of it comes in. It's, it's, it's a wonderful clinical tool. Uh, imagine living in a world without anesthesia. If you, if you uh, got in a car accident, broke your leg or anything, and required surgery, think of uh, uh, the difference it makes knowing that, okay, I'll go to sleep or they'll give me a spinal, my leg will be numb, I won't feel anything. Uh, as opposed to the terror we would live under if anesthesia didn't exist. It's really an amazing discovery. Indeed. So in, in uh, the first research in uh, anesthesia was uh, Claude Bernard, a famous physician in uh, 1846, I believe. And uh, he was studying chloroform, which is an anesthetic, which I think was used as a, to put queen... Uh, uh, Queen Victoria, probably. Thank you, Queen Victoria, who had a C-section, I believe, and, and they gave her some whiffs of uh, chloroform and knocked her out. She thought that was terrific, so she could have her, her c a cesarean section. And uh, he was trying to figure out how it worked, and he was studying uh, uh, simple cells like amoeba, mm -hmm. uh, which move around, and uh, inside the amoeba, the cytoplasm, including the, the, the cytoskeletal microtubules and other proteins, move around and kind of ruffle, and they can move the whole cell forward. And he, he exposed the amoeba to uh, chloroform gas uh, over the top, and he noticed that the amoeboid movement, the ruffling on the cytoplasm, stopped, absolutely stopped. And uh, when he blew off the uh, chloroform, replacing with air or oxygen, it resumed, and the amoeba just kept on its way. Now, this finding is in some ways central to your own theoretical work. Well, it shows that there is an effect in the cytoplasm, in the mm -hmm. interior of the cell. And, then, and the, you could say, well, it's acting on the membranes, and the membranes are affecting the interior. But in the 1930s, it was shown that this effect actually happened directly on the internal part of the cell. Mm -hmm. That part was forgotten for many years, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a key finding. Now, and the cytoplasm is, it, it's not the same as protoplasm. Uh, the cytoplasm technically, I think, is pr protoplasm is the interior of the cell within the membrane, and cytoplasm in includes uh, uh, the membrane, or maybe it's the other way around. I actually don't remember, but one of them includes the membrane, and one and the cytoplasm includes just the interior. And the cytoplasm was thought for many years to be uh, kind of a, a minestrone soup of of uh, stuff floating around, and. Uh, that's because when the electron microscope came along in the 1930s, for about 40 years, the electron microscope uh, was used with a fixative agent to, to kind of freeze the tissue, to, to, to stain it for the electron microscope. And the fixative agent they were using, osmium tetroxide, was dissolving all the cytoskeletal structure. So it was literally broken into little pieces. And when they looked, they saw all this stuff kind of floating around, mm. kind of disorganized, like a minestrone soup. Yeah. And in the early 1970s, Keith Porter, an anatomist at, uh, at Harvard, switched from uh, osmium tetroxide to glutaraldehy glutaraldehyde and found all the structure. He found these filamentous structures called microtubules everywhere inside mm -hmm. all living cells. And for a while, they were thought to be artifact, and people argued back and forth. But it turned out, out to be the case that, uh, yes, the microtubules are real, and the internal uh, cytoplasm of cell structures are, uh, are highly organized. It's, it's like there's an architecture inside each and every cell. Exactly. A very, uh, a very uh, refined, uh, 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 highly uh, sophisticated architecture that not only uh, provides uh, structural support, moves stuff around, processes uh, materials, but also seems to process information. So it's not only the, the plumbing, it's not only the structural skeletal support, it's also the nervous system of the cell. Mm -hmm. Now, if 
If I recall correctly, Stuart, you became interested in the microtubules by looking at the whole process of uh, cell division when they right. reproduce and how neatly they seem to uh, right. accomplish that as if there's, uh, in, in the very act of splitting apart uh, to reproduce, the cell shows uh, an enormous intelligence. Yes. Uh, I spent a research elective in a cancer lab when I was in medical school in the early 1970s, and we were studying mitosis, cell division. So we have all these chromosomes which replicate, and then these structures, centrioles and mitotic spindles, which are made of microtubules, come along, and they grab, the microtubules grab uh, one uh, m uh, chromosome on each side, so uh, one daughter chromosome here, one over here, and pull them apart. And, uh, and that's to, to get separate uh, sets of chromosomes for the daughter cells. And if this separation isn't perfect, it's, it's a really a, a delicate dance, and if it's not perfect, if you have 51% uh, to 49%, or you don't have a perfect uh, match, then you get abnormal genotypes mm -hmm. in the daughter cells, some of which can be uh, non-viable, but some of which could be malignant and lead to cancer. In fact, it's, it's a theory of cancer, a very old theory, that's now making a comeback called aneuploidy, where the abnormal mitosis per se is the, is the cause of cancer rather than a result of cancer. But in the early 70s, everybody else in, in my lab uh, got fascinated with the genes and the chromosomes, and this was the dawn of genetic engineering, and, mm -hmm. and we all know what's, what's come of that. And, uh, but I, for some reason, got obsessed or fixated with how these, uh, these protein cylinders, the wispy filamentous structures, uh, knew where to go and what to do. There seemed to be some intelligence there. And they were anchored by these structures called centrioles, which are also made of microtubules, actually nine doublets or triplets mm -hmm. of microtubules. And I just got really interested in how they knew where to go and what to do. Now, do, let's define for our viewers very carefully, because it's central to your theory, what a microtubule is. Yes. So, uh, uh, most people say it's part of the skeletal system of each and every cell, like the bones in our body. Mm -hmm. um, they are uh, protein polymers, hollow uh, polymers, kind of like an ear of corn. Uh, that's hollow. Mm -hmm. With the kernels, the, the components of the, of the tube, of the cylinder, are made of a protein called tubulin, which is a peanut-shaped protein uh, of, of two monomers. And these uh, self-assemble uh, in the right biochemical milieu. You get the calcium down, and you have uh, uh, some energy, and they self-assemble, and uh, that's what forms the structure of the cell. And the more asymmetrical a cell, the more it needs these uh, microtubules to to, uh, to establish the, the symmetry of the cell. And neurons, being the most asymmetrical, are most dependent on microtubules. And, and the fact that they self-assemble seems quite astonishing in and of itself. It is astonishing. And actually, because of uh, entropy, uh, they are creating order out of disorder. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that entropy tells us the uh, order will tend to disorder. Things, yes. you know, rust, evaporate, you know, everything kind of wears down over time. And how they do it is, a, is a amazingly uh, uh, simple, actually, because each tubulin uh, by itself, when it's not assembled, has a bunch of water ordered around now, it. Now, you use the word tubulin. Tubulin is the individual protein, mm -hmm. the kernel in the ear of corn, the mm -hmm. individual proteins, and, uh, and billions of them, uh, well, thousands to uh, thousands to 10,000 to make one microtubule, and then in one neuron, uh, b uh, billions to make all the microtubules. Mm -hmm. When they're all by themselves, the proteins, before they assemble, have a bunch of water attached, and that's a certain amount of order. And, but when they assemble, they lose most of the water, and so the net uh, gain in disorder is greater than the, than, than the order. So the microtubule assemble is actually more disordered than all the individual tubulins floating around. It, it's amazing that uh -huh. nature is that clever so that something that complex can come out of, out of disorder when it's actually working towards disorder. In, in other words, it's not violating the laws of entropy, but never, nevertheless, it's, it's a, accumulating or, or concrete, concretizing more and more order. Yeah, it's kind of uh, it's kind of taking taking advantage of a of a loophole mm -hmm. in in the second law of thermodynamics because it's actually increasing disorder to make these beautiful structures. It's as if a, a skyscraper would would suddenly would self assemble by itself by getting rid of uh, of order in each and every component, mm -hmm. and that's that's life. That's how life uh, uh, develops. Well, we're getting into uh, one of the great mysteries in all of science, because uh, w what you're suggesting 
is, is that these microtubules are at the heart of the mystery of life itself, and then you go further and say they're at the heart of the mystery of consciousness. Yes, and uh, I do believe that. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I can say that is due to anesthesia. So if you go back to uh, Claude Bernard showed that uh, anesthesia prevented this flow in, in the cytoplasm, which is dependent on microtubules. And the next thing that happened in the discovery of, uh, or in the, in the study of anesthesia, was that the about the turn of the 20th century, two guys, Meyer and Overton, Meyer in Germany and Overton in England, uh, did a bunch of experiments on, on uh, anesthetic gases. Mm -hmm. Now by then, in addition to chloroform, nitrous oxide, and ether, many, many anesthetic gases, or many, many gases had been discovered to have anesthetic properties mm -hmm. at different concentrations. The more potent ones would only require a very small amount of anesthesia to put, put you to sleep, and the less potent ones would, would require more. But a lot of them, a number one mystery was they were all structurally different. Some were halogenated hydrocarbons like, like halothane uh, or, or chloroform. Some were uh, ethers. Uh, some were inert gases like xenon. Xenon is an inert gas, forms no chemical bonds, mm -hmm. but yet it's a very good anesthetic. Uh, so they were structurally similar, uh, structurally uh, dissimilar, completely different. Yes. Another interesting f feature. But the effect would be the same the in each case. The effect was the same in each case across all animal species. Mm -hmm. So they determined a way to measure the potency of these gases by exposing an animal or creature to anesthetic gas concentration. And they looked at salamanders, fish, insects, frogs, uh, mice, dogs, and humans to determine the, uh, the effective dose, essentially it's called the MAC, the mean alveolar concentration, where half of the animals will go to sleep and half wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Now we, we use the MAC as the average and then we, we cheat by adding an extra standard deviation to make sure that the outliers are covered. But basically it tells you the potency of each anesthetic. So every creature and even plants are anesthetized, can be anesthetized at about the, at the same concentration. It would take the same concentration to put you to sleep as it would a salamander. So the, the concentration, he's smaller, so he's going to... Well, what does it mean to put a plant to sleep? Plants have tropism, so they respond to light, they respond uh, in various ways. What can, what can you define tropism? A tropism means uh, a behavior, for example, uh, a sunflower will turn towards the sun. Mm -hmm. So that's a tropism. And uh, uh, it, it's just a behavior towards towards something. And uh, uh, I'm not big on this, or I haven't studied very carefully, but I know that plants can be anesthetized also. Okay. And plants do have microtubules. In mm -hmm. fact, all cells have microtubules, with the exception of uh, a certain bacteria which have something, something similar. So they knew that all, the that all these gases had anesthetic properties, and that at the right concentration put all creatures to sleep, the, the same across creatures. And they were all structurally different. It was uh, very bizarre, actually. Mm -hmm. So Meyer and Overton made an amazing discovery. They looked for a property of all these different gases that uh, they could relate to their potency. Yes. So they knew that, for example, a gas, name, a gas called methoxyfluorine requires only 0.25%, uh, a, a quarter of 1%. Uh, breathing. So if you're breathing 100% air, 100% oxygen, and you put in point, uh, quarter percent of methoxyfluorine, you're going to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Something like uh, halothane was about 0.76, uh, sevoflurane uh, more, ether more, and, uh, and nitrous oxide way more, like uh, more than one atmosphere. You never go to completely sleep with nitrous oxide, but it supplements. Mm -hmm. And other gases at, at several atmospheres. And they look for a physical parameter, something that would relate to the, the potency, relating the potency to a physical parameter. Mm -hmm. And the answer turned out to be solubility, how mm -hmm. soluble the anesthetic was in a particular environment. Now, <clears throat> the particular environment turned out to be something like olive oil. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are ways to, you know, you can look at a body in many ways. It's made up of different tissues, organs, cells, biomolecules, but you can also look at a body or a brain as solubility compartments. Mm -hmm. So pharmacologists use this all the time, and the, uh, one of the major criteria is the polarity, the degree of charge mm -hmm. on the drug and on the tissue that's going to attract it. Mm -hmm. Now most drugs are polar, that is to say they're charged, they have electrical charge, so they're soluble in water. Something that's soluble in water needs to have a charge because water has all these 
oxygen and, and hydrogen uh, charges, and something that has charges will glom onto these and form tr transient uh, hydrogen bonds and, and other bonds that, that are uh, essentially electrical in nature, and that makes them happy in, in a watery environment. Which is the <coughs> basis of neural transmission, in effect, is it not? Well, neuro neurotransmission, yes, because uh, when a neuron secretes, uh, uh, releases a, a neurotransmitter, it binds to its receptor uh, Partly by charge, but partly also by nonpolar effects. Okay. So the anesthetic uh, turned out to be anesthetics turned out to be nonpolar, mm -hmm. to, to be to not have charges sticking out. And they're very insoluble in water. You can't. You, they don't dissolve very well in water. They're very poorly soluble in any liquid uh, environment. <clears throat> what they found was that they are highly soluble in a nonpolar environment, namely olive oil. Mm -hmm. So olive oil, we know it's 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 in our kitchens. It's it's a mixture of of uh, a benzene-like molecules, mm -hmm. and uh, which means they have uh, what are called pi resonance electron clouds. Now, this is another interesting story. When uh, when chemists in the 1700s were trying to figure out uh, organic chemistry, th they were looking at hy hydrocarbons. So you start with uh, with methane has one carbon and, and four hydrogens, and ethane has two, and then uh, and you get longer and longer chains, <coughs> and uh, they had a certain form of CN. Uh, uh, C uh, with with two hydrogens and two extra We're hydrogens. We're talking about hydrocarbon chains here. Hydrocarbon chains, but they also knew about benzene. Mm -hmm. Benzene was C six H six. It didn't have any extra uh, hydrogen, so it didn't fit with all the others. It the other forms a ring rather than a chain. That's right. But they didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, a chemist named Kekulé, a uh, German chemist, one night had a dream yes. about uh, snakes, a series of snakes, which were the hydrocarbon chains, yeah. and one, cha one uh, snake swallowed its tail, mm -hmm. making a ring. And uh, he woke up in the morning and said, benzene must be a ring. It's, yeah. it's got six carbons and it doesn't need the two extra hydrogens because of the carbon. And that also in, in mythology that's known as the Ouroboros, which yes. is a, a snake a swallowing its, its yeah. tail. But what that means is that there are, <coughs> the, uh, the, there are three extra electrons that, uh, that don't have any, anything to bind to necessarily, so, but they're still neutralized, so they form delocalized electron clouds. So they're the, above and below the ring are these clouds of electrons that aren't in any one place at any one time. They're kind of delocalized, mm -hmm. literally a cloud of electrons above and below. Okay. And now when you know, we think of electrons as particles, but when you describe them as a cloud, you're really talking about a, a quantum effect. That's right. Quantum they're superposition. Superposition, right. Superposition. They're actually not in any one place. They're, they're smeared out more like a wave. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the fundamental uh, uh, issues in, in quantum mechanics, the thing that particles can behave as waves, and this is a classical example of it, or a quantum example of it, of an electron cloud, and it's also the basis for organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, these these uh, benzene rings, or phenyl rings they're called when something's attached to it, uh, are, are found throughout biology. In fact, dopamine, the neurotransmitter, and also the, the, uh, the uh, feeling, the emotion molecule the, mm -hmm. uh, that makes you feel good, supposedly, uh, is, is basically one of these uh, benzene rings or phenyl rings with, mm -hmm. a, with a, a, a polar tail on it. Now, we got into all of this organic chemistry, though, because we're looking at the role of anesth anesthetics. Right. So anesthesia binds in an environment that has these rings. Yes. So olive oil is an example. It's just a whole bunch of these rings and if you go to the gas station uh, benzene but when it's in bulk it has di different uh, properties so right. when they're isolated and certain uh, and kind of in an array they can have a but very are you saying we have olive oil in our nervous systems yeah well olive oil like uh, uh, regions that's uh -huh. true now fat uh, uh, like in membranes and elsewhere in the body is largely uh, ha have these rings so they're uh, they're nonpolar mm -hmm. uh, and for many years, people assumed that anesthetics acted in the lipid parts of membranes yes. in the neurons of the brain, mm -hmm. because the lipids are are nonpolar, and the interior of the of the lipid membranes have these rings, and that's and anesthetics do go there, but they also mm -hmm. go to fat stores throughout the body. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't tell you where they're exerting their effect on consciousness. So in the uh, uh, it, it turned out that proteins in membranes uh, open and close to let ions fall through and are receptors for binding neurotransmitters. 
And people in the 70s and 80s began to think, well, maybe anesthetics are acting on proteins, either extrinsically or directly. And in 1984, uh, Nick Franks and Bill Lieb in, in London uh, figured out that anesthetics act directly on proteins because mm -hmm. proteins have interior regions that are nonpolar, that are olive oil-like. And they do so because they there are certain amino acids, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine, which have these six-sided rings, or, or mm -hmm. five and six in the case of tryptophan, which coalesce because oil and water don't mix. Mm -hmm. So that led to these uh, nonpolar regions within proteins, which also support quantum effects, which gets into quantum effects. And this is uh, more towards the heart of your theory. What we're talking about is consciousness being affected by anesthesia and uh, related to molecular uh, properties that border on the quantum realm. Border or are smack in the middle of quantum Smack realm. in the middle of the quantum realm. So really what you're pointing towards is how your journey as an anesthesiologist led you into looking at the role of quantum physics in consciousness. That's exactly right. And that's where we will be going in uh, some of the future segments of our six-part series on okay, consciousness then. in the brain. It's been quite a journey here uh, to think about uh, the, the role of mind-altering substances and, and where that can lead. Well, anesthesia takes away your mind, it takes away consciousness. Uh, drugs which enhance it, some people would say, including psychoactive psychedelic drugs, actually promote the quantum state, whereas anesthesia takes it away. Stuart Hameroff, what a pleasure it is uh, exploring probably in a deeper way than almost uh, anybody would have to offer the many facets of consciousness in the brain. Thank, thank you. you so much for being with me. And thank you for being with us. Let me encourage you to check your channel listings for part three of our six-part series on consciousness and the brain. Thank you.